Hello, welcome everybody. I'm Barbara Fenchevik. I'm the faculty director of the Center for Internet and Society. And I'm really excited to welcome you all for our event tonight, Internet Freedoms and Their Consequences. It's sort of an interesting coincidence that today we are celebrating American Censorship Day. I don't know whether you have heard of that, but American Censorship Day is an initiative by a number of public interest organizations and companies that have come out in opposition to a bill that uh, a couple of bills which are currently making their ways through Congress. And they have some innocently sounding names. So it's the Stop Online Piracy Act or SOPA and the Protect IP Act. And you know, most of you will think, you know, online piracy, stopping online piracy, that's not too bad, or I'm not a copyright lawyer. But I really urge you to have a serious look at the discussions that, surround, that are surrounding these bills because they have significant problems that will fundamentally affect how the internet operates. And to give you just you know, five um, brief bullet points on what the problems are, they threaten free speech on the internet, they threaten the technical infrastructure of the internet and make it more difficult to make the internet secure. They erase due process and enable copyright holders to disconnect sites that they think don't do enough to fight copyright from payment costs and advertising networks. And yeah, that's sort of a brief collection. If you're interested, um, on the Stanford CS Twitter account, we have posted links by, to letters by entrepreneurs and VCs and where they explain how this would, would affect them, to letters by more than 100 law professors, including me, that explains how these bills will threaten free speech and the infrastructure of the internet. And what's really interesting and how this is relevant to today's event is that these are bills that try to introduce measures that we oppose in other countries. And some people have talked about this like having the Great Firewall of China just in the US, um, in our country, where at the same time we tell other countries to protect internet freedom. But we don't want to hijack today's event to talk about this. We have another event on December 7, probably, that will bring um, you know, venture capitalists, law professors, hopefully some network engineers, um, entrepreneurs to talk to us about the problems with that bill. But you know, if you are even slightly interested in this, I urge you to take a look at this now because Congress is going to move very quickly on this. Um, the copyright owners have flown every CEO in the country to Washington to give, uh, convince members of Congress that this is a good idea. And at this point, the only thing that can stop this is either widespread public opposition, you know, signified through calls to members of Congress or letters to Congress, and having lots of CEOs of affected tech companies, entrepreneurs and VCs travel to DC as well and do something. So if you know entrepreneurs, CEOs of tech companies or VCs, um, that might be something to talk to them about. But now we want to talk about internet freedom and how that affects foreign policy and other things. I'm really excited to have two people, you know, of whom I'm a big fan, Andrew McLaughlin and Evgeny Morozov, um, here to talk with us about it. And Terry Winograd will moderate the, the debate, so I'll briefly introduce him and then hand things over to Terry. So Terry is a professor of computer science. Um, he works on human-computer interaction design and on designing technologies for emerging countries. And um, a lot of people know him because he was Larry Page's PhD advisor when he was at Stanford. Um, of course, he has done lots of other really interesting work, but that's something that often comes up. Very relevant here is that Harry has had a long-standing interest in the social implications of technology and the ethical implications of technology. He was a founding member of the Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility and today is the co-leader of the Liberation Technologies program at Stanford here, a really interesting program that looks at you know, the, the potential impact of technology in um, 
helping foster civil liberties um, all over the world. And with this, you know, thanks Terry for taking over the moderation and welcome everybody. Thank you, Barbara. Um, let me just take a quick opportunity to give a plug here. Uh, the Liberation Technologies Project, which Barbara mentioned, has a weekly seminar on Thursdays. Both of these gentlemen have been speakers in the seminar. Uh, Evgeny's. Who is better? Uh, yeah, you were both excellent. Okay. <laughs> this is a. But then get I'm, twice. I'm a moderator, but, but Evgeny is talking again on December 6th, first. December 1st. Uh, Thursday afternoons, 4.30. Uh, you can find the schedule on the web, but he's going to be in a couple weeks. This week, it's actually in a different place. It's uh, it's Seeper uh, instead of Wallenberg Hall, which is where it normally is. And it's going to be some students who are in the course that I teach jointly with Josh Cohen uh, called Designing Liberation Technologies. And they're going to be talking about the projects they've been doing in Nairobi. So 4.30 is Seeper this week, 4.30 Wallingburg Hall, two weeks from now, one week from Thursday. Uh, you get turkey, right? It's not official. So um, hope to see you there as well. Lots of interesting speakers. Uh, when, I, when I was given the job of introducing these speakers, I went and looked up stuff on the web. And I found out this unfortunate fact, which is there is a huge amount of stuff. Not just that lots of people refer to them, but they have both done a tremendous amount. I mean, the list of achievements and a list of where they've been and where they publish and so on goes on far longer than you want to spend time on, because uh, you want to hear them instead. So let me just say a couple of words. Uh, Evgeny is currently a fellow here in the Liberation Technologies program, uh, and working on a variety of writing about the internet. Uh, he has most recently published a book called The Net Delusion, uh, which talks about this is basically the topic of this talk, uh, what the net can and can't do in promoting democracy and dealing with authoritarian regimes. He has published in, and there's a list here of papers in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, it goes on and on. Uh, he's very, very widely read uh, and widely respected as one of the most thoughtful commentators on com internet in general, and in particular, the social political implications. Uh, he came to this from having grown up in Belarus, so he understands what it's like to be in a society that isn't as open as ours. Maybe if Barbara's right, it won't be but, uh, in the future. Um, and uh, has been here for a couple of years as a fellow. We've really enjoyed having him around. Andrew is also a fellow, but at the CIS, Center for Internet and Society. Uh, he's also the executive director of Civic Commons, uh, as of fairly recently. Before that, he was, I'll read his official title. Uh, Head of Global Public Policy and Government Affairs at Google. This is Vice Deputy CTO for the United States at the White House. Just deputy. So, so he has there been. There were no vice deputies, sadly. <laughs> sadly. There's plenty of vice, but no vice deputy. Plenty of vice, yeah. Um, so he has been in both the government sector, the commercial sector, and now working in the public sector. Uh, really has a very broad. Uh, understanding of all these issues as seen from these different perspectives. Um, when we talked about having a debate, um, I realized that you know, you're going to be disappointed. It'd be nice to have a debate where you say, internet good, internet bad. And then you could sort of go back and forth between these. One of the emails we had in organizing this, um, I think it was Andrew who said, one of them said, this is gonna, we're going to have to figure out a way we can disagree. All right, because uh, the two of them are both very thoughtful observers. They're not somebody who just takes a strong position and pushes it. They really are able to see the different arguments in between them. So uh, we'll let them each give a little bit of a starting talk on, on their views on the topics, uh, and then have a back and forth between them, and then go to public questions from the audience. Cool. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to kick this off. So it turns out the good news is that we actually do disagree about some things. And we're going to try to, we're going to, try to dig into that a little bit. I think broadly, a way to think about uh, this is um, uh, I'm a, a, a sunny optimist, and uh, Evgeny is more of like a hard-bitten realist. And what I'm going to try to do to kick things off is give you a little bit of a case for optimism, a case for thinking that 20 years from now, the world is going to be a better and a freer place as a result of the internet, its architecture, the services that we're building on top of it. And um, 
uh, there are, to be sure, some dark shadows uh, lurking in what I'm about to say. There is plenty of room for abuse of the internet um, as a tool of censorship and surveillance. Uh, but I'm going to try to paint as good a picture as I can for why we should be optimistic. So the first proposition uh, to put on the table is that information is power. It's a truism that's been repeated uh, too many times to count, but it is absolutely true. Uh, and what the internet does is it changes the equations and the dynamics of power, uh, change relative to the communications networks that have come before. Um, and in particular, the way to think about what the internet does is it decentralizes both the ability to read, to listen, and to hear, and to watch, and it decentralizes the ability to speak. So when you think about the internet, you have to think about its um, evolution and its uh, uh, growth from the communications networks that came before. So the telecom network that we all grew up with was something which is called a circuit switch network. And what it was in practice was a device that had a great deal of intelligence in the core of the network. Um, the device that you had in your house was basically this like dumb thing with 12 buttons and um, all of the um, core kind of functioning of the network, setting up calls, keeping the channels open, getting them around the planet, all happened in these um, large companies like AT&T that sort of monopolized in, 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 in the bulk of their years of existence, monopolized the communi communications infrastructure within a given country. And so um, channel switch networks basically didn't evolve very much over decades. You know, if you look at the last two decades of the um, uh, 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 of the old wireline phone network, you know, the sum total of innovation was basically like voicemail and call forwarding. You know, it wasn't very much. That's because any changes had to happen in the core of the network and they had to leave the devices in your home functioning the way that you were used to them functioning. They did upgrade at one point from dial phones to push button phones, but you know, that was about it. So what the internet is, by contrast, is a, an agreement among networks that they're going to take any kind of communication, video, text, voice, um, uh, images, and chop that communication into little uh, bits called packets. And a packet is basically a postcard. It's basically got a to address and a from address, and then you have a little bit of room to stick some payload. And the way that the internet moves communications is, analogous to sending a novel by postcard. So if my video or my email or my voice uh, communication is like a novel, what the internet does or what my computer does is rip out all the pages, uh, put a to address and a from address on them and then send them out into the uh, network. And all that the network does is take each one of these packets, um, move it closer to the destination, you know, hand it off to whoever their next um, partner is that can move it closer to the destination. When it gets to the destination, the communication gets reassembled uh, by that computer. So anyway, this is a very different way of doing communications. What it means is that all of the power uh, is at the edge of the network. Um, in the core of the network, all it's basically doing is moving packets from hop to hop, but all of the power to innovate and change and create and speak and so forth lies in that edge machine. So I'm painting, by the way, a simplified picture of the internet. It's much more complicated in the way that it actually works and not quite as rosy a picture for some reasons that I'm about to go into. But generally speaking, my device gets to do what it wants. The whole network voluntarily uses the same definition of what a postcard looks like, what a packet looks like, essentially. And it's a voluntarily cooperative network that now spans the globe and includes you know, every corner of the planet. OK, so what does that mean? Well, the decentralization of the network and the ability to speak and produce uh, speech has led to a democratization of the power to speak. And as I said before, information is power, so the availability of this capability is changing power dynamics around the world. It's not intrinsically or inherently positive. It doesn't have to only be a good thing. For example, you know, the power to speak uh, is used by extremists and jihadis. Um, the fact that these packets traverse over physical networks that are located in jurisdictions means that governments in those jurisdictions can basically penetrate the networks and sh uh, uh, commandeer them to be able to spy on what people are doing. They become tools of surveillance and are susceptible to great firewalls like in China or 
um, the kind of DNS blocking that uh, uh, Barbara mentioned earlier that's being debated in Congress right now. So it's not an unalloyed good. So then where do I draw a sense of optimism from? Well, basically this, my sense is this, that the great balance of power between the state and the citizen depends on many different factors. But one of the things that the internet does is it changes the equation of power in the following way. Uh, the internet makes it very, very cheap, and uh, to say this in economic terms, it dramatically lowers the transaction costs to be able to find and connect with other people, to be able to exchange information and create conversations that can form the basis for collective social action. It doesn't mean that it will always happen. It doesn't mean that it's going to always be a good thing when it does happen, for example. Um, distributed cells of the Al-Qaeda organization can use these technologies to organize collective actions to kill people. Nevertheless, in many different kinds of societies around the world, um, we see that people use the internet to very, very cheaply share information, build narratives, tell stories, exchange news, and create common understandings that they can then use uh, to uh, fuel collective action. And so uh, when you look at a country like um, Tunisia um, or uh, Egypt or Libya, the Arab Spring countries, what you see is not the internet somehow magically creating a social rev revolution, but rather enabling committed people both to talk to each other and to talk to others who are not so committed initially to persuade them to become more committed and actually translate these conversations into action in the streets. Um, that's one of the ways in which I think the internet is changing that equation. Um, and so uh, uh, I'll just conclude by saying um, it is absolutely the case that smart and nimble dictators are going to be able to uh, uh, work hard, be entrepreneurial and energetic in the service of maintaining their uh, uh, grasp on power and so try to use these kinds of technologies to maintain their rule. I think we'll in our debate go into some of the reasons and ways in which that's going to happen. But it is never the that nevertheless the case that the internet at the moment is evolving faster than all but the very best and the very richest of these dictatorial regimes can keep up with. And so for those reasons, I find myself optimistic about where the internet is taking us. All right. Um, so I also have good news. I think that is actually the more I hear, the more I think we have grounds to disagree with. Uh, so uh, <laughs> good. I was, I was I was getting a little bit worried because we had a similar debate at um, the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington two years ago, and we really did our best, but we it still was, couldn't find any grounds for disagreement. It was a real snoozer. Uh, <laughs> so we have we have some history. Um, but um, so to frame uh, my own view on this, I think it's very important to understand uh, the background from which I'm approaching this issue. And for me, um, it's not so much a debate and it's not so much you know, an attempt to understand the internet as it is an attempt to understand how the internet fits uh, a particular foreign policy project, and that project is promoting democracy. I come to this subject as someone who's been on the receiving end of democracy assistance from the US government when I lived in Belarus, when I worked for various NGOs. And for me, the big question that has more or less um, led me in my career in the last, well, before I started writing, when I still was working in an NGO, that question was, what is the relationship between the internet on the one hand, uh, foreign policy on the other, and how does the debate about the freedom of the internet affect the debate about the freedom via the internet, if you will. Right, so the interaction between those two, freedom of the internet as a technology policy issue, and freedom via the internet uh, as a foreign policy democracy promotion issue, that relationship for me has been uh, very important. And I've been trying to understand how exactly uh, that relationship works. Um, listening to what Andrew has said, I think I wouldn't at this point describe myself as a realist who works against some utopian optimistic position. I would actually call myself more of a cyber agnostic. And by this, uh, I mean that I actually refuse to take a position uh, with regards to the political consequences of the internet, in part because I don't see how that position helps anything in the foreign policy debate. It clearly helps a lot, 
in the technology policy debate, right? You clearly want to be optimistic about what the internet does and what it has delivered if you want to have a technology policy that will favor internet freedom. On that, if I was in uh, Andrew's shoes, I probably would be an optimist as well. However, I think about this as a foreign policymaker, as someone who sits, say, in the State Department and thinks about ways in which the internet can be used uh, to promote people, in, uh, to help people in Egypt or Tunisia or Russia or Kazakhstan. And they have to think about what kind of attitudes they have to take with respect to the internet. And I think from that perspective, the only attitude they can have is agnosticism. It's to assume that the internet doesn't have a firm, one-dimensional, one-sided effect. And instead of thinking about the internet as some kind of collective term, they need to go down a few levels and start thinking about particular technologies, whether it's, say, technology of the packet inspection, or whether it's technology of cyber attacks, or whether it's a technology of facial recognition, or whether it's a technology of social networking. And then try to think how each of those technologies on their own can either help to promote liberties or suppress them, and then figure out what it is that the US government and others have to do in order to maximize uh, the liberating potential of those uh, technologies and minimize the repressive potential. So for me, while I think it's normal to take normative assessments of particular technologies that make up this big collective term that we now use to refer to the internet, which, by the way, refers both to the technological network and to a cultural artifact. I mean, right now, when we talk about the internet, we don't only mean the network, we also mean a whole set of other tools and practices, whether it's social networking or chatting or texting, right? So uh, that definition of the internet as a cultural artifact is very fluid and is changing every day, and I think it would be a mistake to take a normative position with regards to that um, artifact. But that aside, I think the key disagreement between me and Andrew is in him assuming that the design and the architecture of the internet is going to have certain political and social effects that are certain and can be predicted. I certainly would agree that the architecture and the design of the internet does have an impact and does have certain outcomes, it's just that we don't know what those outcomes are. <laughs> and they may change depending on the political economy of the web. They can change based on who owns the infrastructure. They can change based on who has more resources, whether it's the governments, whether it's the activists, whether the technology companies, all of that is more or less up for grabs. Um, the other point here is that, again, I think we are too fast in drawing conclusions about what the internet does or doesn't, looking solely at the architectural level. I mean, the way in which most people that I know of who live in Russia or China or elsewhere in the developing world, I mean, they certainly interact with the architecture on a daily basis, and there is no way for them to escape that architecture because they have to use it even if they don't realize it. But what affects them is the way in which the Googles and Facebooks and Twitters and others of this world actually build their policies and decide to uh, treat user data, treat users, and build policies. A lot of this is shaped not by the architecture, but by the actual uh, software and web software services built on top of that. Uh, and that is, of course, in part deriving from the architecture, but I would argue that a lot of what's happening on that software level uh, is uh, up for grabs and also can be co-opted for all sorts of political and other purposes. My own project in the last what, three or four years has been trying to document how authoritarian governments have found spectacular uses to the internet. Um, and here I think it's a bit of an error to try to think that all the internet does is restructure power relations between citizens and governments, allowing citizens to speak in more and better ways. I mean, that of course is true. But what I would argue is that our knowledge, and here the fault is probably mostly with political scientists, our knowledge of how authoritarian states operate is not exactly up to date. And for that reason alone, we do not entirely understand how the internet fits the needs of those regimes. Uh, in the case of Russia, for example, in China, what I have discovered is that those governments 
for many reasons actually have embraced the worlds of blogging and social networking in part because it allows them to learn what's actually going on in their own backyard. The regional, um, the centers and the capitals of those countries don't always know about the level of corruption uh, or all sorts of other problems that are happening in the regions. And uh, having people share that knowledge with the regime uh, is actually a plus. Uh, and this is just one of the examples in which this new decentralized forms of sharing information can actually end up making some of those regimes effective. Uh, there are all sorts of political, social, and cultural factors that, of course, we'll need to introduce to be able to understand what the internet actually does, right? And uh, the impact of the internet, I think, uh, on this I agree with Andrew, uh, can probably be broken down to two major uh, factors, it's reducing the cost of access to information, and it's reducing the cost of action between citizens or people. The problem is that, or any other kinds of parties, the problem is that in order to understand how those two basic uh, you know, phenomena and processes will shape a given society, we need to know the inner workings of that society. Uh, we do not, as long as we do not have a full picture of what's happening in that particular state or regime, we would not be able to understand what kind of processes those two basic features will transform. Right? We start with a very simplistic model that all that's happening in authoritarian states is citizen fighting governments. And of course, if you start with that very simplistic model, then the end conclusion that you reach is that, hey, the internet is the greatest thing ever invented for those regimes. But if you start introducing other complexities, like they need to spread propaganda from the perspective of authoritarian regime, or they need to engage in surveillance, or they need to actually uh, monitor uh, lower level officials, uh, or all sorts of other goals and functions of uh, typical of a authoritarian government, they actually start realizing that the internet is far more useful uh, to them that we have previously realized precisely because we've been lacking their theoretical knowledge of how those regimes function. Um, the other point I'd like to make, and we can maybe move into sort of shorter remarks at this point, is that we also need to understand how the embrace of the internet freedom agenda by the U.S. government actually affects the liberating potential of the internet. And on this, I've been probably far more pessimistic than Andrew, thinking that the way in which internet freedom agenda has been embraced by the State Department so far has mostly actually been harmful to that liberating potential, in part because there are all sorts of things happening domestically that set up a great trap for America, and we've heard about some of those things at the very beginning of this talk. Uh, it's all sorts of legislative efforts to uh, crack down on piracy or to crack down on anonymity or cybercrime, you name it, there, are, there is no shortage to uh, such efforts happening in this country. What we need to understand is how this domestic debate affects the credibility of America as an actor who's trying to use the internet to promote democracy and the good in the world. <coughs> And my understanding so far is that we, and by we I mean you know, American policymakers, have set up uh, a very dangerous trap in a sense that we have spoken so eloquently and we have promised so much to bloggers in Iran or Syria or China that it's essentially impossible to deliver on that agenda, and that agenda is unrealistic knowing what's likely to happen in the U.S., which, and again, I'm not making any normative claims here or any normative statements. I think we are going to see more internet regulation in this country, and as long as we see more internet regulation in this country, the rest of the world will interpret it as America not sticking to the internet freedom agenda itself, which will erode the credibility of America. We've had this discussion with Andrew earlier, and as I understand what Andrew means and, and, and is, is trying to make of this is that it's actually okay. What we can do is to use the fact that now we have this big internet freedom agenda targeting China and Iran, and actually use that as an additional level, as an additional way to influence the debate domestically, which I think from an activist perspective is actually not a bad tactic. You can say that, hey, if you as a senator oppose net neutrality, you have to be prepared that a lot of tools that will be developed to monitor traffic will end up monitoring uh, Chinese dissidents. Um, 
I think there is probably an activist case to be made for this. I'm just not sure why the U.S. government is setting up such traps for itself. Uh, maybe it was some kind of guerrilla action by Andrew while he was in the U.S. government <laughs> to set up those traps deliberately. But I think what is going to happen is that if, say, the U.S. Congress uh, and the Senate uh, do end up regulating the web, and do end up unleashing all of those tools on the world, the credibility of the U.S. to speak about the internet will diminish, but also the credibility and the ability of the U.S. to speak about other issues that have nothing to do with the internet will diminish as well. And this is something that I think we need to keep in mind, especially if you go back to the, back of, go back to the beginning of my intervention and think about uh, the comment I made about the broader foreign policy debate. I mean, there are other tools on the table. It doesn't have to be just the internet that we should use in China or Iran to promote democracy, right? And my fear is that by being very, uh, not particularly careful with how we use and talk about the internet in Washington, we'll actually end up constraining our own uh, arsenal uh, even further. And I think I've added a little bit more disagreement to this table, I hope, so we can. Well, first of all, I disagree with you about whether we disagree. Uh, I think there are some points of agreement in there, so I disagree with you on that. Um, so let me um, let me pull out. So let me let me pull out two threads um, to 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 poke at. Do you poke at threads? Let me pull out two threads to snip at. Okay. So the, to disagree with. Yeah. Well, to disagree. So you just use that word to, a lot. Yes. To yeah, whittle down relentlessly. So um so one one thread is. Um, Uncertainty about the internet's effects, and mm -hmm. you you take a position of, um, as you call it, agnosticism. But but fundamentally, um, you um, argue that it's a bad idea to have any real sense of certainty about what the internet's architecture pretends in the future. There's so many variables. The social, cultural, and political contexts are mm -hmm. so varied. The mm -hmm. politi uh, political uh, uh, economy of the internet is changing so rapidly. And then the second one was about um, sort of foreign policy. I'm taking mm -hmm. these sort of out of order, but this was the sure. one that you started with, that you said that you think primarily about kind of the implications for foreign policy, including the interaction between domestic mm -hmm. and foreign policy, and uh, uh, among other things, the moral high ground or lack thereof mm -hmm. that the United States is setting itself up for. Okay. So um, on the first point, and it flows into the second, so I'm going to take them in that order, uncertainty about the Internet's effects. So I, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just say, you know, you, you, you noted some variables um, on the architecture. You said, you know, there are resource gaps um, between uh, states and citizens, and it's hard to know what those are going to be in the future. Uh, there's this evolving political economy and so forth. But I do believe that we can pin some of these variables down, not to predict with any certainty what the uh, internet is going to be like, but in order to derive a sufficient amount of uh, input to make rational judgments about what US policy ought to be. And that is to say uh, we can take the architecture of the internet, we can look at the kinds of services that are being provided uh, on top of it, we can look at the ways in which the underlying protocols are changing, um, and uh, uh, we can make some judgments about where US policy might be useful. So going back a step to this question about sort of foreign policy and the implications of the internet for it, um, so I do think that we can make some normative judgments about what U.S. policy could usefully do. So let me first say, what is the thing that we're trying to do? So as a country, it seems to me um, there are sort of a couple of different ways that you can frame our national interest um, abroad. One of those ways is uh, in, in a kind of uh, normative values-based sort of America's mission is to make the world free. But you can take a much more restrained uh, kind of self-interest oriented approach and say that America's interest is America's well-being and that our well-being is more likely uh, to be served by a world which is stable and a world which is democratic is more likely to be a world is, which is stable and so the promotion of democracy fueled by things like individual free speech and freedom of association and the other kinds of values which um, um, you know you can point to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, as embodying. These values generate stability or generate you know, meaningful 
uh, uh, democracy in some sense, which generates stability, which is in the U.S. national. I don't care which way you frame it. Either way, the U.S. has, I think, in my view, an interest in seeing the world be uh, freer and, and uh, hopefully, though not essentially, but freer and more democratic. So if that's the goal, um, which is to say uh, uh, that world, then there are some internet-driven policies that make sense. I'll caveat this by saying I actually completely agree with you about all of the self-destructive and counterproductive ways that the US government has approached the internet freedom issue, which is to say that by essentially politicizing the internet as a tool of freedom, meaning as a tool of subversion of the rule of many regimes around the world, the US has essentially played into regime narratives whereby Facebook, Twitter, and these other services become sort of tools of the CIA, tools of nefarious American foreign policy interests. And it does, in that sense, shoot, it is a way of shooting ourselves in the, in the foot. When the State Department, um, you know, a, an official sort of claimed credit for keeping the Twitter, you know, keeping Twitter running during the post-election period in Iran, I think it's undeniable that that played right into the hands of the Iranian regime in delegitimizing uh, the tool, at least for some uh, Iranians and for some period of time. Um, so that is, of course, true. On the other hand, I guess I would argue with you about the extent to which that actually matters to people out in the world. In other words, I think many of the activists that I know, including in places like Egypt and Tunisia, which are relatively friendly, where the activists, I think, are relatively friendly to the US, there is a deep and profound pre-existing cynicism and skepticism about anything related with the US. And I'm not sure that those incidents actually uh, are as catastrophic as you, as you make them sound. Mm -hmm. So um, let me say, make three policy ideas that I think are useful. Um, Oh, and let me just say, I don't think we're ceding much moral high ground, in other words, when the US is acting sort of inconsistently or hypocritically or shooting itself in the foot, because I don't know that we have all that much to begin with. OK. So anyway, what do we do as, as, as a matter of policy? So Evgeny has pointed out the, the US State Department has had this approach which says, we support internet freedom, and the Congress appropriates us money, and we spend that money on anti-circumvention tools, and we're now spending that money on um, uh, services that try to catapult emails into China with, you know, the day's news or whatever uh, propaganda the U.S. government is pushing these days. We spend that money on tools that um, uh, try to make it um, possible to get communications in and through the firewall um, without traceability, um, and so forth and so on. So this is like a clear foreign policy objective. Um, and um, what I think we can draw as kind of lessons from the architecture of the internet that we can have some reasonable amount of certainty about are the following. One, the world is a better place and internet free speech and freedom of association and so forth are more likely to take place when the internet is, uh, operates in an environment of diverse connectivity. So when um, Egypt wanted to shut the internet down, they were able to do so because there was only one company, Telecom Egypt, which had the ability to move packets in and out of Egypt. So there was one very central control point, choke point, that they could go to to shut those um, communications down. In Libya, it was the same way. There was one company that had a monopoly on all communications in and out of Libya. Interestingly, by the way, there were um, some uh, academic links in and out of Egypt that the government hadn't paid any attention to that were able to keep live. Um, during the shutdown, and that showed the value of diversity of connectivity. One thing the U.S. ought to be doing is using the various tools at our disposal, diplomatic, persuasive, um, and otherwise, um, to try to encourage countries to not constrict connectivity in and out of their country. A greater and tighter mesh with more paths in and out is um, more likely to stay up and running. For example, in the post-election period in Iran, there were a number of links that were uh, 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 kept live, usually through the academic community, out through Turkey, even when the fiber cables going down to the UAE um, were, were uh, turned off. So there's a policy objective that we can set that's based on the architecture of the internet and what's more likely to support freedom of, of speech. Um, a second one, by the way, is uh, uh, pursuing policies that promote the dynamism of the internet. In other words, you raised a couple of concerns about the power of private companies, so the power of Facebooks and Googles and others because of their massive market you know, sort of reach to be able to do things that would violate privacy, collect data that could betray people uh, to a repressive government. Um, there's any number of things that they could do as private actors um, in this 
voluntarily interconnected collection of private networks to violate human rights. And one of the things that the US ought to do is aggressively be pursuing domestic policies that promote dynamism on the internet. In other words, that make it more likely that new disruptors and new innovators will come along and um, uh, restrain the market power of those big, large actors domestically, in part because that'll have an influence globally. Um, that's in tension, by the way, with our trade policy, which is to try to make sure that American firms, you know, uh, beat the Baidu's of China, the Yandex's of uh, Russia, and these other, you know, competitors. But nevertheless, I think it's in our long-term interest to make sure that no company has massive market power for long periods of time. And uh, yeah, I might flag as one particular policy domestically a net neutrality regulation that keeps telecom carriers from choking off innovation through uh, uh, private sector bureaucratization and control um, is definitely um, a good policy that we ought to be pursuing. And that leads me to my third one, which is broadly speaking, it would be nice if the US government didn't regulate in ways that were blandly hypocritical, like for example, mandating internet um, uh, uh, DNS blocking even as we argue against it globally. One footnote that I want to add here, though, and this is a little bit of an argument against my own interest, um, but it's one that I think is uh, like important to, to bear out, and that is this, that one of the things that um, the arguments that been, that's been raised in Washington um, is that um, you know, DNS blocking is bad because uh, China and Iran and these other countries um, have implemented it. Um, and that, I don't think, is actually such a strong argument, and I'll, I'll, I'll say why. And it leads me to a broader point about the kind of moral high ground that the United States um, ought to be able to occupy. And that is this, that what makes um, uh, DNS blocking bad is because of the destructive impact that it has on freedom of speech. Oh, domain name, sir, yeah, so sorry. Let me add a footnote here, thank you. Uh, it's a second footnote. Yeah, sorry, I keep adding footnotes, <laughs> it's like a like a disease. Um, so so um, what DNS, so when my uh, laptop wants to go get a website, like if I want to see CNN.com, I type CNN.com into my browser, and what happens is my computer engages in what's called a domain name lookup to translate that domain name into a number, because the numbers are actually the things that identify all the different websites and hosts and end devices on the internet. And so there's a service called the Domain Name Service, which is a big distributed database that you know, is um, um, global and includes you know, all the comms, nets, orgs, UKs, FRs, and CNs, and so forth globally. Anyway, what domain name blocking means is that a government tells its ISPs, you need to block particular domain names. You need to not allow people who want to reach that website to reach that website using domain name. There are a bunch of variations that you can use. I won't go into them. But basically, it's a technique that China and Iran and Syria and all our favorite friendly allies have been using for many years um, now. I mean in internet terms, six or seven or 10 years in some cases, to try to block access to certain sites, NewYorkTimes.com and so forth. And uh, anyway, what's being discussed in, in uh, the Congress right now is whether the US government should require our ISPs to institute a DNS blocking system to stop copyright infringement um, uh, being perpetrated by foreign websites. Technically speaking, though, it's exactly the same technique and exactly the same tool that's been used by repressive governments. Anyway, my point is this. Repressive governments and democracies built on a rule of law often have the same tools at their disposal. It doesn't make the tool inherently bad. What gives a country the moral high ground or not is whether it's democratic, whether it adheres to the rule of law. So our police have tasers, the police in Burma have tasers. And what makes their use bad is that they engage in unrestrained exercises of repressive power to maintain those in power in power, whereas ideally anyway, and footnote three, you know, give or take uh, abuse by police departments, which of course can happen in even the most, you know, um, Scandinavian of democracies. Um, you know, th that uh, it's the rule of law and our democratic institutions and the checks and balances of our institutions and the multiple levels of our government and all the oversight that happens here that makes that tool not used. So um, that brings me to my concluding point, which is the United States should avoid regulating the internet for our own self-interest and because it makes us, um, it keeps us from becoming a hypocrite abroad, um, but primarily for our own self-interest. All right. Um, so I think I now I have an even better vision. <laughs> where we disagree. I think what you do is that you have an agenda about the internet and about the internet policy in general, and what you're trying to do is to hijack 
the foreign policy agenda of the US government to promote the internet agenda that I partly share. And do it on the assumption that the internet is good for democracy. That's why what's good for the internet will be good for US foreign policy. And I listen to your suggestions about things that you think US foreign policy should do. And I do realize that all of them are informed and heavily influenced by considerations of internet policy. But I've also been thinking, what would happen if I would go to someone who sits, say, on the Syria desk at the State Department, or who sits on the you know, Kazakhstan desk at the State Department, and ask them, if you had to articulate what would be priority number one with regards to the internet, given your interest in your region and given US foreign policy interest in your region. And let's assume that those interests do not involve supporting a dictator, which occasionally they do. So what would that person answer? I think what would that person say would not deal with the dynamism of the internet or DNS settings. What that person would say is that we want to ban American companies from selling surveillance technology to our dictators. That would be probably the most immediate response because that's actually happening, right? And that's happening on a massive scale, and we have no ways uh, so far to stop it. Uh, and that impacts what the lives of dissidents in those countries much more. My bigger point stemming out of this, and of course you know very well about the surveillance problem, but my bigger point is that I would rather have people with regional experience and knowledge of particular regions look to the internet and figure out what it is that they want to take from it and what it is that they want to discard and how it is that they want to pressure their governments to regulate Silicon Valley or to regulate, uh, uh, you know, um, or to fight Hollywood and their lobbying interests, rather than to start with a bunch of very smart internet guys who may not know much about Syria or Kazakhstan, and have them push their own internet agenda. And I'm not talking about you that much. You I'm can. talking cool. about no, you people can. like you know, Ali Cross or Jared Cohen, who were not on the architecture side of the internet freedom policy, who were dealing mostly with you know, Silicon Valley and Web 2.0 and all of this fancy stuff. Uh, and I think that was one of the big problems. But so what are they getting wrong? What, well, I mean, what are they getting wrong? So, I, so it's I, the wrong people coming up with these policies. But you mentioned, for example, sure. a prohibition on the U.S. worrying about our own companies selling uh -huh. surveillance equipment to the Syrians. Yes. Shouldn't that be a primary concern? Like, shouldn't, isn't, should it, it not be a matter be, of national that, policy? Not necessarily. Again, I would rather leave that decision in the hands of people who formulate regional policy and who know what kind of a priority it is. Can it you may be. Any it may be, again, I'm, I'm arguing with myself now, but it may be that if I had to rank five top things to do for what the US should be doing in Belarus, it may be that the sale of surveillance technology would not be among those top five. Just because we all care about the internet so much doesn't mean that it you know, will be number one on our foreign policy agenda. Right, but surely we're not limited to five things in dealing with Belarus, right? I mean, like, we can, <laughs> yes, we can say are, that but, you, but this course, office over here works on... Sure, but there are opportunity costs. And my fear is that the general excitement about the internet that was clearly present in the Obama campaign back in 2008 has transformed U.S. foreign policy in the two years that followed in with regards to the internet in ways that were not particularly healthy. Uh, in part because regional expertise was suppressed in favor of people who have their own agendas for the internet. And again, I share much, many of those agendas. I just don't what's think your best, that What's they, your best example of where we're getting it wrong? Who's we? Uh, where, I'm sorry, we're the, the Obama campaign veterans who infected the uh, foreign policy establishment. Well, are again, you, it may, wrong. you made those examples yourself. I mean, the uh, claiming the success. Of course, that was not uh, that was a, that Twitter. was a holdover from the Bush administration. I mean, that kind of, right? <laughs> but you can easily so, imagine. What's, what's, what, can what, easily, where, where well, else? The Obama administration wrong took credit for it, right? The State Department took credit for it, and no one disowned it. The White House did, but not the State Department. Anyway, um, uh, but so, but so, where, but like, give me an example of where where regional policy making or country policy making is uh, is getting it wrong. Well, you know, pick a country. You know, Egypt. Um, until very, well, until Mubarak left, whatever Ali Cross and Hillary Clinton were saying about internet freedom and the freedom of Egyptian bloggers and what it is they could do, you know, didn't register 
anywhere on what the U.S. foreign policy apparatus was doing, in part because the objective of the U.S. foreign policy was different. And that was a very bad objective. I mean, they wanted to support Mubarak. And I think the way to make things work is to critique that original intent behind that policy. It's not to try to change policy by focusing on the internet. You see what I'm saying? That if you want now to bring democratic change to a country like Azerbaijan, for example, I don't want the US government on the one hand to say, hey, we promote internet freedom and we want to support bloggers in Azerbaijan, and at the same time, actually go and support their dictator financially and otherwise. In a sense, this internet freedom thing allows the tech guys who are all, you know, very excited about the internet to claim some success within the US government while allowing the rest of the US foreign policy apparatus to get away with pretty bad foreign policy. And I'm not saying that we should just shoot down the good guys and, you know, and just concentrate on what we do wrong, but we actually have to make sure that our excitement about internet freedom still allows us some space for critiquing the more fundamental pillars of U.S. foreign policy. Does it make any sense? Yeah. I mean, I think what's, you know, so what's interesting about what you're saying is uh, to uh, risk, you know, characterizing it in, in a way that you wouldn't. But what's interesting to me is that you're saying that, um, you know, well, the State Department's got, like, regions and then they've got these issues, right? And there's always this, in American foreign policies, there's always this tension between the kind of like regional or the country strategy and then these cross-cutting interests, non-proliferation, pr uh, fighting human trafficking, you know, internet freedom is one of those, sure. um, fighting drug, the drug trade. But, you know, we get these kind of like issue focus or, or fighting copyright infringement is another one. You know, issue focus and then you've got these kind of regional focus. And there's a constant tension you know, in, within the State Department where, you know, like the Human Rights Division and then the, you know, country desk for, you know, let's say, um, uh, you know, uh, Pakistan, you know, are going to be, you know, f sort of fighting with each other. The Pakistan person says, we have, so what's interesting to me is that you're, the, the, the part of your case that I would agree with the most is that um, uh, for each, for any country that the U.S. wants to somehow be pushing to change, um, the internet is, you know, one among many, many, many different things that have to be taken into account. And it can reinforce some of these other issues. It can run counter to them. And you've got to do this kind of like sort of balancing as a matter of foreign policy. And I guess your argument is that um, the kind of like sexy internet people from the campaign showed up and started tilting the balance wildly towards internet and away from this kind of mm -hmm. environmental, ecological, sort of holistic approach to um, the change that we want to be pursuing. So I guess I will quarrel with you on that and that I just don't actually see that playing out very much in reality. I mean, when I um, you know, sort of look at the key countries that are the focus of US foreign policy, I don't see too much interference or balance coming out of the um, uh, uh, kind of activities of the internet people. Um, but I'm open to persuasion if you want to persuade me otherwise. But um, also, what theoretically I and intellectually, I mean, it's not just about the people, it's also about, say, a concept like internet freedom, which now, if you believe Hillary Clinton, is a new pillar to U.S. foreign policy. That's what she said in her original speech, that you want to make internet freedom one of the new pillars. But and so again, then we have to ask, what are the implications of that? And do we actually need such a concept? And uh, what are alternative ways uh, of essentially achieving the same agenda without necessarily <laughs> putting it all in words, right? So, and this is what, what really bothers me. Uh, it's not what the intent is. It's that the way in which it is explicitly communicated and the way in which it ties the hands of the U.S. government elsewhere. When you get someone like Hillary Clinton get on stage and say that the United States government opposes the use of cyber attacks and condemns and then she doesn't mention that the U.S. government is actually one of the governments that launch cyber attacks uh, regularly, you know, to take out websites of jihadists and, you know, and whatnot. And it kind of does set a very bad precedent. So in this, I'm actually quite cynical. I don't mind them doing that. Yeah, I so mind them saying that see, because so I do think that there right, are what, what, to it. Well, so here's, here's, <laughs> the, here's the thing. So here's what's, 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 what's interesting to me is that you just said two things that I think are difficult to square. One is by talking about its advocate, by talking about our belief in internet freedom, we undermine mm 
the potential to realize internet freedom because mm -hmm. of the way that you nationalize and then provoke reaction or some, something mm -hmm. like that. On the other hand, if the U.S. is secretly doing cyber attacks, you think we ought to be openly acknowledging that we're doing them rather than letting that happen behind the scenes. Like, isn't the U.S. use of Clint, you know, sort of unacknowledged cyber attack actually like good because it means we're doing the thing we ought to be doing only uh, not claiming credit for it? No, you know, I'm very Machiavellian on this actually. No, I think it's okay. Okay. And I'm actually, I'm okay so with hypocrisy. So the hypocrisy doesn't... I'm okay with hypocrisy. I am not okay with that. In, I'm not okay with the tactical use of hypocrisy. See what I'm saying? I don't mind. I don't mind the hypocrisy in... I'm actually, my, my next book is a defense of hypocrisy in politics against the <laughs> open government movement. I have no problem with hypocrisy. I have a problem with the fact in which it constrains the ability of the U.S. to operate in the foreign policy arena. That's where my problem so, is. So after, the, after, after tackling the internet freedom movement and then the open government movement, you're going to attack the like cute puppies movement or the, <laughs> sure. the uh, cute kittens movement on the internet? So, um, so I got to say, I, so there, here, I'm, here, here we, get, we get a nice point of disagreement. I actually think that it is good and useful and valuable that the United States declares itself um, committed as a matter of national policy to mm -hmm. a free and open internet. Um, I do think that that is, I do think that that's a worthy policy for the United States that follows on decades of commitment to freedom of broadcasting, freedom of communications, um, and uh, the confidentiality of communications um, in, 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 uh, around the world. And the reason that it's a good thing is because a world in which, very, in which no governments were stepping sure. forward and saying that they believed in that, either domestically or internationally, seems to me like a world which is much less likely to realize that because there is a value in the rhetorical commitment um, that gets made. I, I always think uh, back um, on a set of interviews that I saw one time about, it was about what um, it was about what the Carter administration meant for human rights, and it was a set of conversations with sort of human rights activists around the world saying that it mattered to them even if there was no possible practical connection between what their governments were doing in the United States, that it mattered to them that the U.S. government announced this commitment to human rights and started taking actions however imperfectly, however ham-handedly, however like sort of, you know, goofily. Um, to try to make human rights a part of our foreign policy, and it gave them courage that the sort of direction of the world was heading in the right, uh, it, the, 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 the you know sort of evolution of the world was heading in the right direction, and um, um, you know Lech Valenza was one sure. of them, and there were others who said that you know it mattered to us that they talked about it, mm -hmm. and you could have made the same argument about the U.S. in the late 1970s that by publicly associating the United States with the protection of human rights, we exposed ourselves to be hypocrites, having toppled you know regimes and. Um, and back dictators uh, that it um, uh, you know that it um, uh, provoked regimes to react in kind of a negative way just because the U.S. was you know to be oppositional to us. And for the same reason, though, I think it is valuable for the United States to take that stand and make it part of our foreign policy because, in no small in, in no small measure, <clears throat> the specific policies that we ought to be taking flow from that broader commitment. And I think it's a commitment that's worth being acknowledged. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Could you make one, one more comment on that? Then I want people to have a chance to ask some questions. Don't you entertain the possibility that in the near future, the terms of the debate in this country may change in such a way that the majority of people would actually favor some kind of restraint put on the internet and the architecture? And I'll give you a particular example. So. Some kind of restraint, some kind of limitation, uh, basically to move away from the open internet as the priority even in the domestic context. That may be cybersecurity or that may be something else, concerns about cyber war, you name it. And the reason I'm asking this is that because there was a survey released in Britain last week, which asked people about their response to the possibility of shutting down social media and the internet in times of unrest building on the riots in London in August. So people were asked, would you actually approve of the government having the ability to shut down social media if we have another wave of riots? And over, I think, 60%, but the majority definitely said yes. Um, which to me means that you know, if you hold a referendum and the majority say yes, it does give the legislators 
you know, an agenda to move forward with changing the internet. So to me, the question is, why do you assume that an open internet is what the public actually wants, other than the normative commitments that you hold yourself about the yeah, so here's theorem? And, you know, how do you ensure that, you know, the kind of needs we'll have to reshape the internet infrastructure in the next five or ten years, how do you know that those needs will be met by an open internet? And then, then if they're not met, how do you square it with the kind of defense that the U.S. has been doing internationally? Well, so here's, here's, why, here's why I have faith in... So if there's a religious. Yes, of course. <laughs> I'm uh, invoking a higher power here. Um, no, I have, I, 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 I justify, I'll say it this way, I justify my optimism about the United States um, in the following way. One, um, we have a First Amendment for exactly this reason, um, which is to say that the sort of theory of the First Amendment, in one sense, it's, or a theory of the First Amendment, is that it's kind of, it's, it's, it's Odysseus lashing himself to the mast as you enter the, the realm of the sirens, right? What the First Amendment does is, it says the United States is committed to freedom of expression um, regardless of the temptations that may come along the way. And it presupposes that people in times of crisis or national emergency, that this country will be tempted to vary from its higher ideals embedded in the Constitution. And uh, our Supreme Court, and uh, certainly the one that we've got there right now, is extremely aggressive in protecting First Amendment rights. And in fact, one might argue, finding First Amendment issues like in campaign finance where you otherwise might not think they exist. But um, that's one reason. A second reason is that um, they didn't find there are in the <clears throat> that's fine. There are the, what the internet is under pressure right now, in, in my judgment, from as a series of claims for why its architecture needs to be made less open and more closed. And those claims come from uh, people that want to end uh, uh, child pornography or images of the sexual abuse of children. Um, people that want to stop the distribution of malware, viruses, um, uh, spyware, and so forth. People that want to stop uh, copyright infringement. People that want to stop hate speech, uh, extremism, and the incitement to violence. There are many claims being made for why the internet has to start restricting speech. Mm -hmm. And here's my, this is like a good note for me to end on before we go to questions. Um, my, my ultimate commitment is that um, we have now tasted the economic power, innovation potential, and general anarchic awesomeness of the internet. And I believe that it, it, that it is well within the technological capacity of our researchers and scientists and the economic interests that we can align with them to ensure that a network exists which lives up to that uh, ideal. So if this internet, the TCP IP, globally interconnected internet, gets screwed up too badly, uh, I genuinely believe that the power of wireless communications, Moore's Law, and ever cheaper processors, and uh, ever more capacious uh, bandwidth, um, uh, that the underlying economics of the internet will make it possible for us to build successor networks um, that uh, uh, provide, at least on some rolling basis, uh, until I'm dead, um, <laughs> the kind of network environment that supports my, 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 my ideals. That's where right. my faith comes from. Good. Okay, good, good statement and breaking point for people. Questions, please come to the microphones. So when VeriSign um, a few years ago tried to hijack DNS lookup failures, uh, those of us who keep the lights on the internet blinking modified the DNS lookup software to stop that from being practical. Um, and it was an effective action, you know, they it was no longer viable. They, they gave up on that, at least for the time being. Uh, do you think that if reactive legislation such as SOPA and Protect IP comes into law, do you think that kind of action might be sufficient to get us to the point where, the, to, until the Supreme Court can overturn those laws on First Amendment grounds or any others? Or do you think it's um, a deeper problem than that? You know, I, I'll tell you, I think that one of the best arguments against SOPA is that it is literally self-defeating for the interests that are pushing it for the following reason. The, the DNS is voluntary. Who you choose to get your DNS responses from is your choice. You can just lazily take whoever your ISP, you know, whatever recursive name server your ISP uh, assigns to you, 
or I can use Google DNS, or I can use Pirate Bay DNS. This is one of the fundamental arguments against SOPA, is that as soon as you turn the DNS into potentially an engine of spying or the enemy of the people who um, uh, know what they want to get to, they will simply work their way uh, around. And the reason that that's a problem is A, um, a lot of our ability to detect what's going on on the internet right now, to understand when DDoS are, uh, attacks are happening and where they're coming, to understand when particular bits of malware like the Conficker worm um, are spreading and where they're coming from. Predictable recursive DNS has been one of our best tools. It's not the only tool. It's not essential. We could probably do it otherwise. But man, it sure makes it a lot easier when you're trying to understand what's going on on the network. So I, I, I think one of the arguments um, that should be very forceful, I don't know if it is to the members of Congress that are hearing it, but is that the internet architecture is voluntary and flexible, and therefore if you try to take an architectural solution to the problem, you are more, more likely provoking the internet to evolve in a direction which makes it irrelevant. I'll give you one other specific example. I think one of the dumbest things to happen to the internet lately has been these three strikes laws in various countries because what they do is say to people, I need to start cloaking my activities for my ISP. Even if I'm not doing copyright infringement, I'm just now aware that my ISP is spying on me, so I'm going to start shielding myself by doing point-to-point -point encryption from my browser or my machine to wherever I'm talking to. And I'll tell you, just from a How law enforcement thing, actually do that. Well, so here's the funny I mean, thing. This is, like, the, no, this, is the, this is no, no, this is no, 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 no. But this, this is the argument I get back all the time. Is, is like law enforcement agencies. Ah, it's a tiny little like trivial thing. No, the the best example of why um, it's not some weird geek thing is Skype. Nobody thinks about Skype as point-to-point -point crypto, but that's what it is. Tell me, and, how many people download movies by using encryption? Uh, but if you, uh, if, you were, if, you, if, if you have a three strikes law, if you have a three strikes law, I guarantee you that they will that that the internet will rapidly go from a tiny fraction that's point to point encrypted to a very large fraction that's point to point encrypted because all it takes is a browser plugin. Went up ten percent overnight. What? Yeah, most. I mean, BitTorrent is a great example. I mean, yeah, but France went up ten percent overnight. All right. Right. So, I mean, the French the data is, is quite is is, is 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 actually well documented, which is that the percentage of packet traffic that was encrypted uh, leapt rapidly. And anyway, if you care about law enforcement, I, I actually I'm a, somebody who believes that the DEA, the FBI, the NSA should have robust surveillance capabilities. I want them under the rule of law um, and uh, judicial oversight and all the other things which exist in our in our statutes. I want them to be able to. Uh, sniff and surveil what bad guys are doing in order to catch them and stop them uh, before they do what they want to do. And from that perspective, seeing uh, national policies that provoke an unnecessary expansion in encrypted traffic strike me as a self-defeating catastrophe. So anyway, I'm with you on that one. Go ahead. Uh, so it sounds as if this conversation presupposes that until recently there wasn't very much regulation for the internet. Uh, when in fact the internet went over some very highly regulated parties. So we didn't talk about network neutrality back when we had common carrier status. It just hadn't been an issue. Uh, we can also look at the crypto wars, right? That's another place where there had been laws that have since been changed. So I think my question to each of you is, are all laws the same? around the internet? Are they all bad or good? And if they're not the same, do you have any points where you think laws are good or bad and for what reasons? Well, you're the lawyer, so you're stuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm talking too much. <laughs> uh, well, obviously, no, I don't think that the laws are the same on the internet. Uh, I think, you know, extending Kalia law would be stupid. Uh, In which way extending Kalia law? Huh? And the Kalia I, law I almost means. certainly agree with you. In which way extending Kalia? Uh, extending it to uh, information networks and internet services, uh, making sure that you have backdoors built into Skype and you know and Gmail and whatever. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I get the question. I mean, of course, of course, you have silly laws, and some of them are silly than others. But do you want an example of a law that works? Or? Well, how do you distinguish between <laughs> the good and the bad? Like, what 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 principles do you apply to distinguish between good laws and bad laws? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, 
as a regulator or as someone who cares about foreign policy or as someone who is an artisan or uh, an for me the problem are. with domestic debate I'll tell you for me the problem with domestic debate here in the US is that it's not at all uh, aware of the repercussions of domestic regulation for foreign policy. And that's something I've been really angry about. Because if you look both at Kalia and at some of the you know, debate about net neutrality, there is no foreign policy dimension to them. And now, suddenly, we discover that all the spyware developed to satisfy the needs of FBI uh, ends up in Egypt and Libya and elsewhere in part because we have a very interesting system by which you know FBI can plant spy on your computer and it's all done with some degree of you know legal protection in this country but once those tools are developed by for-profit companies they end up in secondary markets where of course they are used without any legal protections whatsoever so uh, for me, the big issue here is making sure that when we talk about regulation domestically, we actually understand what the consequences of that regulation will be uh, globally, including on the level of technologies and tools mm -hmm. that those regulations you know, would require. I guess I would just say, like, you know, I, I, I think you distinguish between good and bad laws based on fundamental normative principles. And those fundamental normative principles, for me, are informed by the Constitution. They're informed by um, uh, documents like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as to um, what is a good and worthy objective for the laws to be pursuing. And uh, you know, um, uh, working out what those principles mean in practice is complicated and difficult. But that is, I think, the normative standard you apply. Thanks for a fascinating talk. I'm uh, curious about the potential for the internet to, in some ways, uh, spur creativity in um, terms of ongoing technological development. Uh, I'm developing World University in school, so it's like Wikipedia, in, which is now in 281 languages, with MIT OpenCourseWare. We'd like to credit on that. Um, could, and of course, that will move. Uh, virtual worlds will be one space where, that, where uh, interaction will occur. I'm reminded of uh, Manuel Castells, the longtime Berkeley professor who characterized the network society compared to Marx and Weber, um, argument for the internet, basically that it creates um, a network society, um, that that's in contrast to perhaps identity. So Evgeny has perhaps um, raised a lot of questions about identity in terms of practices, in terms of specific um, sort of nation states. Uh, so my question in many ways has to do with um, how could, for example, um, a world university and school in 200 countries and um, building on the internet in 3,000 to 8,000 languages spur these freedoms and perhaps help um, shape the law as it unfolds in much the same way that um, the Obama administration is perhaps uh, embracing network neutrality and building on First Amendment principles? Huge question. I have no way to answer that. You want to take that one again? Uh, no, I have no clue either. Uh, <laughs> Maybe that's a note to end on. <laughs> Confusion and sort of del delirium. Uh, I can talk about identity, but you know, I don't. I just, I know, I don't know. I don't know. That's not something I've thought about. I'm sorry. So I just want to address one issue of um, the way that some countries would regulate, for example, the sale of Nazi paraphernalia, so and they what? Nazi paraphernalia, uh -huh. like say eBay. And so their answer is that it's up to eBay to track down the IP address and associate it with the region. As opposed to saying we're going to regulate it within our own country's top level domain, and then it's up to us to build a firewall if we want to to regulate everything else. And that sets the tone for what we might consider to be international, some form of international law and regulation. And it seems crazy to me that you have a country trying to dictate what happens in top level domains that are outside their what would be, I would consider their jurisdiction. So I'm just curious about mechanisms now, so of regulating some of the interactions that go on and how we have some sort of international framework for this that doesn't require companies to have to track down IP addresses, which of course doesn't always work anyway. So. Yeah, so, this, so, so this, the, um, the question you just asked me is another way of saying like, what did you do at Google for six years? Um, <laughs> so that, that, so the issue that you just raised is, is to me is a really interesting one, right? So. So um, let's take Google just because I know it. So you know, a, a country like Germany has a has a national law 
democratically chosen, revalidated over decades of continued democratic practice that um, both as a, a practical matter and as a symbolic matter, they want to criminalize um, certain kinds of speech. Uh, uh, Nazi paraphernalia, glorification of uh, 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 the Nazi regime, anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial. They've got a bunch of categories of speech that would be protected by the First Amendment in this country, but nevertheless have been made constitutionally and democratically criminal in Germany. So then the question is like, all right, so that's your law. How do you vindicate it when it comes to global companies that are operating from the United States and all over? One simple answer, by the way, is as soon as that company shows up, and uh, eBay, Yahoo, Google, Microsoft, Facebook all have operations in Germany, once you show up in Germany, well, then you've got to abide by the laws there. Once you're selling advertising there, you're selling products there, you have to be subject to, the, to, the, to their jurisdiction. eBay, uh, um, I'm sorry, Yahoo in France had this confrontation first. This was in about 2000 when it was actually France's prohibition on Nazi stuff that was um, asserted against Yahoo. And what they said, not unreasonably in my, in my judgment, was, look, Yahoo, you are capable of IP targeting your users because you target advertising to them. You, you make money by IP targeting, so please IP target for the blocking of stuff that's illegal here. We don't care what domain name you throw on it. I mean, a domain name is just a layer of indirection. Who cares? It's coming from the same server. Stick a .fr on it, stick a .com on it. We don't care. It's still Nazi paraphernalia that you who are benefiting from French jurisdiction are making available in French jurisdiction. So. That was their argument, and it has not, in fact, crippled Yahoo or others you know, that they're sort of subject to it. To me, the trickier question is, what's, what, what, let's take a company that is like Twitter, has no operations in Germany, has no people there, no business there, they don't sell anything there. Um, you raise the question of, should they just impose an ISP filter, like just basically deal with their own domains you know, themselves? but basically set up an ISP filter to block the things that they don't want. I'm reticent to go down that road because as a practical matter, I don't think the US government should be encouraging other countries, much less ourselves, but encouraging other countries, even friendly ones, to substitute um, I, you know, uh, ISP level filtering. Just because it's a bad practice, it tends to break the internet. It makes things harder to engineer. It's just not a good thing to exist. What if we're not so sympathetic to what's being regulated? So then this raises, funny you should I mean, this is like what we did in my class this afternoon. This raises, we're going from like one job of mine to the other. Like, um, did you plan that question? I don't know, apparently not. <laughs> That's a conspiracy theory, Evgeny. How dare you? Um, so, uh, so, um, so it seems to me that one of the big problems on Evgeny's foreign policy challenge, you know, to US foreign policy, is that it's hard to have a single consistent theory um, of which laws you oppose and which laws you endure and which laws you support based on the nature of the law or even the nature of the country. So for example, we oppose blacklists uh, in China. We're perfectly comfortable with them in Germany. Well, you can say that's because China's not a democracy and its laws are not chosen. Germany's is uh, legitimated by its democratic processes. On the other hand, they've got the blacklist in Saudi Arabia and a blacklist in the UAE. Uh, neither one of those can be characterized as a democracy which has developed that law as a uh, exercise uh, through, through a politically legitimated exercise. Instead, they're US allies. And so one of the problems that we have is that it's very difficult for the US to be consistent because we've got a mix of interests, economic interests, diplomatic interests, national security interests, and so forth. And maybe this is what your book is going to talk about, Evgeny, that uh, either for Machiavellian reasons or because of a genuine um, enthusiasm for hypocrisy, um, <laughs> we want to you know, accept that there's going to be these areas of inconsistency because there have to be in foreign policy because life is complicated and it's in part to do with your ideals and in part to do with your national interest and in part to do with the power politics of the world as we see it. Sorry. Last one. So I'm, uh, I'm curious, with respect to dom domestic policy, what your opinions are about, uh, um, so considering sort of the effectiveness of, of various policies and, and how that should factor in in shaping domestic policy as a whole. So you sort of talked about this briefly uh, with respect to SOPA, 
um, with sort of the technical limitations of using DNS as a blacklist, but more generally sort of the uh, the threat model that the U.S. has to deal with is is sort of fundamentally different than one that uh, that countries like China do, with, you know, because um, the, uh, the, uh, the the people that uh, sorry the people that China are uh, presumably um, blocking from from speech are sort of the common person who's sort of maybe viewing whatever Google.com or or the CNN website or something, whereas uh, in in countries like the U.S. we're talking about sort of the uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, a minority of people who are presumably criminals and sort of much more able to, as you as you mentioned, sort of use these circumvention me measures. And so I'm just uh, to rephrase, I'm wondering what uh, how you think those sorts of cons considerations should affect how we think about domestic policy with respect to the internet as a whole, uh, and whether that should uh, um, lead us to sort of uh, fundamental changes in how we think about uh, whether the internet is worth regulating regulating at all or just uh, sort of uh, different and progressively better policies. Make sure I grasp the connection. To well, China. let me let me yeah let me well, let me try one. So, one, one way to answer your answer a question which might have been yours um, uh, is the following, which is um, one of the things that keeps coming occurring to me over and over again in this area is the the way in which um, blocking. Right, sort of blocking, even for the most well-intentioned reasons, turns out to be, as a practical matter, a dumb idea. And I'll tell, I'll give you a, a couple of examples. So, or maybe one, just to capture it. So, one of the big debates that's been go so, let me say the general point, and then I'll give you the example. The general proposition is, when you cut off the network, you cut off your ability to do law enforcement, to actually like track people down. And so, I'm actually perfectly comfortable saying that as a matter of both foreign and domestic policy, it's just a bad technique. So for example, there was a bill percolating through Congress earlier that was going to require the operators of prisons across the US to set up cell phone jammers. Because people were like, ah, oh, there's like all these criminals like, you know, running criminal enterprises out of prison. It's ridiculous. We should be blocking, you know, jamming their cell phones. And, and it makes my head explode because I'm like, no, you should be setting up a tower in the middle of the prison you know, so that you can just spy on all of those phone calls. Like, that's how you track down who's running a criminal enterprise out of the network. Now, I want that to happen under a rule of law and well, protections and so forth. But like, you know, one of the things we should be doing is encouraging people to do as much as possible, you know, of their illicit activities in ways that are actually discoverable by law enforcement. So one of the answers, you know, to bring it back to where Barbara started us off um, uh, with this SOPA bill, is like once you start to do blocking, you are literally cutting off avenues of law enforcement investigation that actually lead you to the bad guys you're trying to catch. Like use the networks to do law enforcement, identify the bad guys and then go find them rather than somehow thinking you can firewall yourself um, off from their activities. I think it's essentially a somewhat unrealistic uh, dream. I mean, the reason why the US had to use cyber attacks, that example I mentioned was because Another part of the U.S. government actually set up a website for jihadists uh, in Iraq. The CIA set up a website where jihadists would actually come and start talking about their planned terrorist activities. Uh, and after a few years, the Department of Defense got so fed up with terrorist acts planned on that website, of which, of course, the CIA knew because they collected all that intelligence, that they actually had to go and launch cyber attacks to make sure that the website disappears forever. Um, right, and for me, the question then, you know, to take your example, so when the FBI sets up a honeypot where people trade in stolen credit card numbers, I mean, how long do you want that honeypot to go on? Uh, until your own credit card appears <laughs> on that website or uh, sometime sooner than that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, just about then. <laughs> right about that long. No, no, but that's a big, you know, because that happened. We saw that happen with the dark market website, right, which was run by the FBI for a number of years. Um, but, but my point is, more, is you know, whether a honeypot is a good strategy or not, I mean, it is one, but my, my point is that generally, if you think about blocking versus using the existence of the network to do law enforcement, I'd much prefer the latter. But um, how much is there to know about people who share films? I mean, what, you want to get the most extensive data mining on what they buy in supermarkets? I and mean, then it's a bunch of guys sitting somewhere in Eastern Europe sharing films. I mean, what's there to collect? 
<laughs> well, I think on that note, <laughs> you we can all... I don't know these Eastern European guys and their math can, criminal enterprises. We can all agree that they did come up with a lot of interesting things to debate. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you, sir.